Noah. Hi there. Hi, love. How are you doing? I am pretty good jumping back into things from a very long but necessary vacation. How are you? Oh, good. You were in, was it the Catskill Mountains? I was. I was in the Catskills for four day, four wonderful, blissful, no cell phone connection days. <laughs> so, it was really, really good. I've never been to the Catskills, but I know it was probably just absolutely beautiful. It was gorgeous. Just phenomenal, honestly. That is cool, cool, cool. Well, for those that do not know, <laughs> this is Camille Essek. I'm the host of the Speaker Podcast. And on this episode, you guys, I am bubbling with joy. I have the amazing, wonderful, charismatic Noah Love. <laughs> Noah, so excited. Thank you for having me. I am, again, truly humbled. I absolutely adore you. You are an amazing individual. So to get to speak to you is just, I'm here for it. I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. So first of all, those that are not familiar with who you are, let them mm -hmm. know who is Noah Love. Noah Love. Let people know who you are and what you do. Okay. So uh, yes, my name is Noah Love. Um, originally born and raised Miami, Florida, official New Yorker, 10 years as of September 10th. I am founder and operating manager of iModels NYC, a boutique modeling agency here in New York City that solely focuses on um, the POCs in the industry um, with a strong emphasis on Black people. And I can kind of dive into that during our conversation of why I separate the two. Um, I am also one half founder of VNF Productions. Um, it is a black owned production company that was launched last year, uh, specifically to cater to the black community. Um, when it came to creatives, designers, uh, we wanted to create a safe space for creatives to come together and build upon each other's talents. Um, aside from that, I am a big brother, a son, an uncle, a nephew, and I take pride in all of those things. Um, yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. So let's let's dissect this because you gave us so much. Okay. So first, okay. let's talk about your journey into creating yes. IP models and the space and the motivation and inspiration for creating this industry and the, the brand within the industry. Okay. So um, honestly, IA was born through, I think a lot of us say this, a lot of creators say this, it was born through a personal struggle and a personal journey of trying to figure out who I was. Um, and having moved to New York City and I knew that I wanted to model, it was a shock. I mean, a culture shock, a career shock to come to a place where I, I honestly was small. And aside from being small, I didn't fit in anywhere. I couldn't reach out to get any help of any kind. And it honestly, beat me up, destroyed my confidence in myself. It destroyed my vision of what life was supposed to be. And um, I was working with the company Amco NYC at this time. And it just, I, I knew that it was time for me to create a space where models, specifically models of color, just felt like they belonged. They felt like they had somewhere to go to get uh, answers to questions for the support, for the constant, you can do this, um, thus, I created IA and initially it was IA management and that's I am. And all I wanted to do was manage the individual, meaning who you are, Camille, as a person is a necessity, no matter what industry you're in, no matter where you are in the world. And that alone amplifies who you are as an individual. Um, and so I've made it my, my purpose, I guess, or I've acknowledged it as my purpose to magnify everyone's necessity in life their need to be here and their need to be exactly where they desire to be. I love it. So it's just like a safe haven for those of us of color within the industry. I, I love that. When you said you reached a point where it just broke you down, a lot of people get to that point and they just stay there. So mm -hmm. no, what did you do? Or um, did you have a tribe or what was your process to kind of get out of that rut? So, and I don't think I've ever thought about this. So you just asked that question. Um, I moved to New York City when I was 22. So this happened around 22, 23. And I technically didn't have a tribe. 
um, it, I didn't have that space. So I feel like we all have friends and we know that these friends support us. We know that these, these friends are ride or die. But when we say the word tribe, these are individuals who can intellectually and spiritually gather you. And I think at that age, myself nor my friends, we none of us was there to do that. And um, God used a multitude of different avenues to break me, to get me to a point where I literally had nothing else, but I pulled out my Bible. I give you everything. I'm being completely, totally honest with you. I was sitting in a safe home, a shelter in Queens, New York, and I was completely over it. Um, I sat at this table, I didn't know what to do, who to call, and all I knew, and this is my grandfather, Reverend Eddie Love, may he rest in peace, all I heard was his voice, and I just, I honestly put my Bible out, and I just sat there with it, and I started reading, and it was in that moment when I, like, just, and I'm no Bible scholar, but um, between reading, starting with my dad, where he always made us read uh, Revelation, and then reading Matthew, and then going to Genesis, and then um, going to Colossians and I just had this moment of there is no way that I'm just going to give up now. At that point that was 22, 23 years of life. I come from a, two parents who suffered um, addiction, um, molestation, being homeless. Um, honestly, the black school system just they're left to their disposal so it's a matter of just what's left. Um, growing up in the ghettos and having to essentially raise my two brothers at a very young age, it was, you didn't go through all of this to just give up. And it was at that moment, and my government name is Kilroy Demetrius Love. Noah is essentially a nickname, a chosen name, where um, I decided I needed to recreate myself. I needed to live in the true purpose of who I was, who God called me to be. And I didn't connect to any of those things. Um, so it really was a moment of completely breaking and being left with nothing else, being completely exposed. And all I had left was the word of God. And his word in basic terms just tells me, I've called you to greater things. If, if you are here, you are not done. And that's what I lived on. It's literally what I lived on for a year. And what's amazing, the fact that you chose the name Noah, when you look at it from a biblical sense, mm -hmm. the storm came, but God mm -hmm. Noah and put him in a safe place. Mm -hmm. and he survived the storm and it was through his love that him and his family made it out on the other side mm -hmm. so I think it's kind of interesting how you chose that name and then with your spiritual background I'm a PK myself so I did <laughs> and <laughs> I think it's just kind of interesting when you're talking it kind of came to my mind like oh wow that's cool so yeah, yeah. I, I just alone your story about um being um, molested as a child and being homeless and that's a whole another conversation. I mm -hmm. want to bring you back to discuss that because I think mm -hmm. a lot of black men don't openly discuss those experiences because we're in that time where masculinity is still in a toxic place where yeah. we don't talk about things. Oh, well, you, you know, and there's just so many connotations that come along with that. But mm -hmm. I thank you for sharing that because it also opens the door for no another conversation I want to have with you later on. Just because for that's, sure, for sure. that's another episode i think there's so many uh taboos and stigmas within the black community like yes. health, child molestation therapy you know that's yes. Yes. and we need to break that open we really do yeah thank you for, for sure. and sharing that no of course of course i own my story i have no shame and it's funny because i talk to my dad about this often i share my story willingly and i never like bat an eye or like run from it because it's liberating in a sense yeah um it's not that i'm taking pride in anything negative but it's the mere fact that i've been through it i've gone through it and i've survived right. i've not just necessarily survived through it i've essentially thrived through all of those things so and then your story can empower someone else because when exactly person is a predator they're taking that power with you but then mm -hmm. telling the story is reclaiming your power and diminishing like yes, yes you did this to me but my past is not going to dictate my future. Mm -hmm. It's only a point of reference. Agreed, agreed. Thank you so much. So going into the world of fashion, and mm -hmm. you and I had this moment where we discussed 
um, Andre Leon Talley, that yes. Lisa, the, the um, documentary that appeared on Netflix. First of all, kudos to the producers of that. That was such an amazing story that they told. So, so, so break, good. Yes, it was. Let's break this up. So let's first of all, how your brand ties into um, creating a space for underrepresentation of Black designers in the industry and how that is still a problem. And we have voices like you creating spaces for us. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the space of Black voices in fashion, design, the creative aspects, the visuals, photography, all of the, everybody from interns and editorials to the person pitching the coffee, over the course of 10 years, and I'm gonna say 10 years, what felt like 20, I've worked in roles every from Blue Magazine to IMG Music Group, where we tend to, it's almost as if our talent and our creative, our creativeness, it's always siphoned from us, not with us. Meaning everyone wants our insight. Everyone wants to speak to us and they're influenced by what we do, but then people take it and they translate it. And it's very, very exhausting. Um, and I say exhausting because we're still in a space and just pull me back if I ever get lost in it. But we, we're in this space where Black voices, we're not echoed, we're just recreated constantly, constantly, constantly. Andre Leon Talley worked in a, in, a, in a space coming directly out of college where thankfully, um, you know, people saw him and they allowed him to exist. And I say allow uh, because they didn't try to water him down. I don't think when you read his story or you watch his story, no one tries to water Andre down by any means. Not um, that allowed it just because of his personal Absolutely not, right. So his upbringing when he talks about his grandmother, I don't think he even would have allowed it anyway because he was, first of all, tall. Yes. Tall. Mm -hmm. His uh, stature at the time was very statuesque. You know, yes. he's very vocal. So I don't even mm -hmm. think Robert would have allowed that anyway. Right. I don't think his existence would have ever uh, just gave room to that. But someone like him, you know, that is what today looks like, where all of us are kind of standing up, um, if you will. But I knew that I needed to do something that, a that created a space for Black people to speak and speak loudly, to stand up. And so, you know, with my work through IA Models and essentially branding models in a way where they're able to vocalize what their passions are, they're able to move through that. Or with VNF Productions, when designers are showcasing, it's not to say that we're completely isolating ourselves from our Caucasian counterparts or um, other cultures, but it, it is something magical about Black people working with Black people because we, we essentially still have an issue where we're like crabs in a bucket. And so, with the VNF team, we focus on Black designer, Black production, Black makeup artists, Black models, everything is because we are essentially teaching ourselves how to work together and we all can eat. That everyone can make it at the exact same time. Our arrival doesn't necessarily have to be this thing where I have to beat you down for me to maintain a level of relevancy, if you will. And again, this is another conversation because I feel like this then pulls into that space of what I guess what the right or what anyone else outside of the black community want us to focus on, which is um, our natural or our innate focus on destroying each other. You know, because I essentially, I have a podcast in, in many spaces, I would not necessarily join your podcast because I have my own going on. But that's not my mentality where I feel like it's enough room for all of us. Yes. I always use that, that uh, quote where if you walk into a grocery store and you walk to the bread aisle, all of these brands, everybody's eating. Why can't we all just coexist, so to speak? But um, in the Black community and in, in, in regards to fashion, you know, Andre Misa, Dapper Dane, um, I even go as far as, you know, Sean Combs, um, Wow, I would forget her name right now. Um, she's she's Jay Z stylist. I literally just forgot her name. Um, June Ambrose. Oh dear God, I don't know how I forgot her name. But all of these people actively work to create opportunities. If you look deep and you take a deep dive into their world, into their offices, they bring in faces like you and I. They bring in the young, ambitious. Aware as well. 
yes, they all are very active about, you know, extending that hand back. And so um, I guess that's what my goal is with IA is being able to reach back and give double of what I was given, meaning, you know, my success, what I, what I consider is very minute. It's a very small portion in comparison to what I'm giving my clients. So. I love that. Um, and, and, and speaking to that, when we look at not only is our energy, is that misappropriated, um, but the fashion, like mm -hmm. our actual fashion, we yes. see being created by Misa or Dapper Dan with the whole Gucci situation where things that were created by us, by our, yes. by these icons, and then it's here. And so, yeah, so it's poorly regurgitated on the runway, you know. It's usually always poorly recreated. It's usually yeah. always done and I, with and I'm less to not flavor. Say that, but that's what it is. It's poorly, it's, a, it's almost like a caricature, you know. It is. Gucci is. I won't say they're notorious for it, but they've done it so much. I have to use the word notorious. There is a designer name. Um, I can't remember her exact name, but her shop is Sonique Saturday. And I came across her maybe eight years ago and she does these bags, these handbags for women and she hand paints them. If you, there is a, a design of Gucci's where there's like paint on their bag and it's dripping. That wasn't an original context for them that wasn't an original design from them from this young girl um i want to say she went to spellman I, I cannot remember but she had a full lawsuit against them and this was my first introduction to um appropriation when it came to fashion this was my first insight my first deep dive because when people said culture appropriation when it came to fashion or even hair honestly i didn't pay much attention to it I just felt like everything influences everything. Again, this is a mindset where you are not fully educated. You're not completely aware. And so you don't pay attention to these things. So this young lady went through years and years of trying to fight for um, her creative rights. Meaning she had created something in this large brand had taken it and essentially she could have lost everything. She could have lost her avenue, but she didn't give up. She chose to fight this large conglomerate. Um, but when it comes to fashion and the appropriation of our culture, it's been happening for so long that so many of us kind of, we normalized it for a while. And I think uh, those um, in you and my age group at this point, we've woken up to the idea like this, this not gonna work no more. This can't work, you know? Um, we don't have the time and we don't have the space to just let you take what we have. Um, intellectual property is a real thing. And I think more and more of Black people are realizing, oh, wait, you owe me. Whereas back then, you know, a lot of, a lot of our uh, friends or family members just kind of let things slide. Um, can we stop fashion appropriation? I don't think it's a means of stopping it. It is just understanding that if it, it you need to be loud and don't be afraid to put it out there and consistently brand yourself consistently control your narrative control your messaging because then people are gonna there it's constantly gonna happen it's happening in this very moment and i don't think you can fully stop it it is just a matter of understanding what the law is in regards to that you can fight and you fight till your teeth fall out um is it sad absolutely is it upsetting 1000 percent? everything from hair i'm still irate about the fact that kim kardashian was pinned with the title of um, creating cornrows. I use that whenever I speak about the issue of appropriation because we've been doing this for decades. You know, this is something that we've done um, not just for fashion, but you know, for the protection and the healthcare of our hair. And then Adele, I think she posted her picture wearing bantu knots. And yes. Flipped out about it. And absolutely insane. Again, um, it's not about giving kudos to the culture; it's straight appropriation. Mm -hmm. You know, we see uh, now some of um, non-melanated counterparts wearing the uh, bobby pants stacked like Solange and other things. And, and the list goes on. And not right. just in our, the clothing, but in our physical attributes. Because for so long, particularly women of color, have always been ostracized for having full lips, hips, booty, you know, mm -hmm. breasts, 
but now, you know, women are spending thousands of dollars to get lip injections, butt injections, getting their waist snatched, breast implants, tanning, you know, yeah. and like when music, the music, everything. All of it. Food, you know, now you see a lot of um, non, again, non-melanated restaurants selling hot chicken. Well, that mm-hmm. came from Nashville and it was created by the Prince family, Prince's Chicken. But now everybody okay. eats hot chicken, you know, so it's just like, you know, you, you, what's that saying? You want our rhythm, but not our blues. And yes. And it's very true. And I, th- you saw get out, right? Yes. So I used get out as a means of conversation for a very long time, specifically to my nieces and my nephews, when we have the conversation of why this matters in our world and why we have to be very much aware of what you do, how you do it. And this is a conversation that I have with the boys because again, we're in, a, we're in a position in life right now where it is to let your children walk out the door is terrifying. I don't personally have children. I have nieces and nephews and they're melanin. Yeah, same here, yes. So I use that movie as a reference because it, that is probably the first time you will ever see the, the, the two sides of, uh, of the coin. They hate us because they genuinely want to be us. And this is the only way for them to do it is to take what we have and destroy us. And if you look at that, that is what life has been all the while. Um, To your points of appropriation, someone, we were having a conversation a couple of weeks ago and they said, well, black women wore wigs and straightened their hair. And I had to express the fact that there is a difference in cultural appropriation and assimilation because black people post-slavery, in order for us to be safe, in order for us to live amongst our Caucasian counterparts, we were told we had to do certain things, speak certain ways, and, and, and essentially live a certain way to be safe. It was a survival. So it was a survival. It really genuinely was survival. What you are doing, when I say you, ca- Caucasians essentially, what you are doing is you're, you're literally stripping us again of our own. Our culture is what we are rooted in. It's what is what protects us. It's what it, it's what inspires us. Um, I won't go too deep in that because I feel like your pod, your podcast is a very safe space and a wholesome environment. Um, but this conversation can get extremely volatile because we are a when we say culture, you essentially can't include the Caucasian race. They are picking from everywhere and putting it in a pot. You and I can identify with a specific. You and I can literally point out our roots in everything that has been taken from us and essentially inspired the rest of the world. Um, And again, this is coming from a black boy who woke up four years ago because we allowed a celebrity to go into office. And I was like, this can't happen on my watch. I can't let another generation. And I've had to educate myself and read. And I'm grateful for reading Andre Leon Talley's book. uh, um, what is his name? Hill Harper and a few other black men. Um, it just, to bring this all full circle, the black culture, we are consistently fighting for the right to simply exist. And it is both empowering because it keeps us on our toes. We are constantly re- reinventing ourselves and reinventing our culture, finding a new way to reintroduce it. Um, but at the same time, it is exhausting because at some point we do just want to exist. Um, and it goes back to that comment where, you know, I be damned, you lucky we don't want revenge. We want we to exist see- safely. That's it. Safely. Literally, we would love to coexist, but at best we want to exist. Yes, I saw a t-shirt on Instagram, it was so cool. The t-shirt said, ghetto until deemed relevant. It sucks. <laughs> it is the it worst. Sucks. Get on to deem relevant. I was like, wow, that's a whole message on that t-shirt. Right? Wow. But then that's where you and I teach our boys and our girls, be ghetto. <laughs> like I've had to learn and I, I'm one of those people where, um, speaking of Ebonics, the moment I left Florida, I was like, that's just strip that. I'm just not, I'm far too intelligent for that. And it's only maybe in the last couple of months when I realized the power of our language. It's our right, it's, it's our power. Again, it's our culture. And how dare I feel like it's a lesser. 
You know, when I say edu- when I say I'm educated, I shouldn't demean my brother and sister who speak, you know, their native tongue of their community. That's powerful. And I'm learning and I'm realizing there is nothing wrong with mama if she decides to have her non-existent baby hairs, but in fact, her actual hair laid to the gods. Do it, mama. The big lips, the large lashes, do it all. Because I've realized and I've learned what you and I do will forever be considered ghetto and wrong until some Debbie Allen or some Ruth whatever walks into an office and say, I think this is gonna work next season. And essentially that's why I'm in fashion because I wanna be that power head that says, this has been here, but this works. But it's giving credit to you for doing it, not laying it on a Kardashian, you know? And that's what's happening. It's being laid on these upper echelon POCs. Cause let's be real, Kardashians are POCs. They are Armenian. They are a tinted skin. They are people of color. That's why I separate the two, POC and Black, but they're not the same. But um, I won't get you, I, your, your space is a wholesome one and everybody should feel wanted. So we're gonna keep it there. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I'm gonna take a slight break. So I wanna watch everybody in. If you're just tuning in, this is Camille Essek. I'm the host of the Speaker Podcast. On this particular episode, I have one of my new booze, new babe, <laughs> no love. So you like, 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 hey, share, share, share. And yes. um, comment below, please do that. Right now, we are discussing the history of fashion within the industry. Noah is the founder and creator of I Am Models, a space that's a safe haven for people of color within the fashion industry. And right now, we're discussing the appropriation and underrepresentation of designers and within the fashion culture. And Noah, you touched on something. We were talking about being ghetto until deemed relevant and how it's not until um, someone with that outside our community wears one of our looks and then it's, mm-hmm. it's viral, it's trending. So touching on that and then transferring what we know there into how has fashion changed? Oh, we see looks that are recycled. Like right now, uh, lately, the baby hairs has been the thing. Mm-hmm. But when you really look at the history of fashion, baby hairs goes all the way back into the 50s or mm-hmm. um, the big curly hair. Well, that's yeah. from the 80s. And it's not anything new, like, um, and I'm not shouting them out, but, you know, in the WAP video, you know, with the swooped hair and the spritz yeah. ponytails with the deep side part, mm-hmm. that's 90s culture. Actually, the 60s remixed in the 90s, and here it is in mm-hmm. the 2000s. So can you right. touch on fashion, how it's changed, how, and how it's recycled throughout um, the industry? So I think what we're seeing at, what, Specifically in 2020, what we are seeing in fashion is this revisit, and I say revisit because it's those of us, Black people who are in spaces of influence, where we're realizing these were like pivotal moments when, you know, you had your Naomi Sims back in the day, uh, she is a uh, legend when it comes to modeling. Remember when your mom would like fully bang her hair all the way up? And that's what you're talking about when you're talking about the, the, the baby hairs. Having to gel this down, again, was a form of assimilation because our hair is so big. We had to do something with it. I remember my mom with the jerry curl um, and slicking that down, but we're looking at fashion just kind of obviously repeat itself constantly, but now the influences are changing because it's the, ne- it's the necessity of um, functionality. So how can I wear this and still be able to go from office to, you know, drinks with the girls, or what can I do to make a statement? And a lot of people want to make statements, which is why the 50s, 60s, and 70s are making a comeback. That big hair, um, I think for the most of us who live in a very present world now, um, we essentially have have kind of come back to that uh, either clean shaven, pretty boy, pretty girl look, straight hair, But you you talk about places like um, Houston, Texas, or St. Augustine, Florida, um, uh, anywhere in North Carolina or South Carolina, you know, big hair, great hair is still a thing. It's never left. Yes, it's never left. And there's, it's still part of the culture, you know, just the the lashes and the lips, the chunky earrings, all of which I love. Chicago, thank you. Um, But we are, I think, those with influence, 
are slowly realizing, wait a second, again, this works. And now those people of influence look like you and me. And so there's a little bit more control. 10 years ago, you know, um, I think our Caucasian counterparts, again, revisited history and kind of laid some things out again. And I think the more and more we go through life in the next 10 years, there will be more black faces that decide lace fronts are still a thing. You know, bushy <laughs> lashes, it, it's not like. It's not one way. So even Knowledge this, of it has improved tremendously, but I don't think it's going away ever. I don't think it would ever. I mean, a lot, I think there's still the conversation of a lot of us giving Ma, uh, Michael, Michael Jackson um, credit for the lace front. Um, no one knew Brandy wore lace fronts with her braids. That wasn't always her hair done in that way. Um, specifically uh -huh. men's oh. fashion though. Wait. Yeah, girl. Those braids weren't always actually attached to her head. Cause I watched like two weeks ago. I binged like the entire the show on Netflix, and one episode it was like the micro skinnies, and then it was like the chunky box braids. Uh -huh. I was like, hold on, last week she had micro braids. How did she? Uh huh. Yeah. So you look at things where essentially people play with technology when it comes to things like that, and you know it's just it's now it's a bigger thing. Uh, but uh, what I was going was specifically when it comes to men's fashion. Um, we are looking at history kind of just snowball in. You're talking crop tops, the bell bottoms, the skinny jeans, um, the large uh, thick belts. It all just kind of came through. And I love it so much because again, and this is a whole other conversation when you talk about toxic masculinity, um, but men back in the day, you're talking about 50s, 60s, and I think you're maybe a little later than that, where we men kind of talk about that and not discuss Billy Porter. You can't, you can't. And I'm, I'm gonna get to him because men back then loved their bodies and they embraced being slender and sexy. And the, the term androgynous, you know, that wasn't a thing for them. They just knew they looked good. They were small and it mattered, you know? And now when you look at that same fashion, but today it's considered androgynous and we can go with it, but you know, Billy Porter is someone who I was introduced to two years ago. And this is a man, you, at least for me, I could watch him and you can almost feel his struggle where he wanted to be his best flamboyant self, but couldn't. And when we were introduced to him in, a, I think most of the world was introduced to him in Pose, that was a, a, a moment of arrival for him where that and kinky boots, uh, where he could be his best self. And, and to have him there, it made me proud just because there are little black boys and little white boys who look at him and it empowers, you know? And sometimes I think fashion gets it, the rest of the world doesn't. A man doesn't have to be gay because he loves women's clothing. Let's be very clear about this. Women have a lot of fun in fashion. You guys get to express and explore your sexuality, your spiritual, your body, your, your child, your history. It's all through your fashion. Essentially, men were left to just jeans, shirts, and a suit. And so now we have the, um, we're revisiting the seven. The, the blue lampshade, what's his name? Uh, uh, th th young Thug. Uh, was it Young Thug? Young Thug, where he had his album cover. He had on the blue. Yes. The, was that Young Thug? It was like a. Yeah, I know you're talking about though. Yeah, his yeah. Like lampshade look and it was like a dress yeah. touch and he was, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And again, art. If you essentially look at fashion, it genuinely is art. And men are just, men are realizing that they can express themselves. And I love to, honestly, I do. I genuinely love to see heterosexual men express themselves through their clothing and not feel locked in. Cause Who yeah, that? Paul caught a lot of shade for his tuxedo. I think- I didn't understand that. I didn't understand it. Cause yeah. bell bottoms was a thing back in the day. He literally did nothing original except maybe the sparkle of it all, but it really genuinely, I didn't understand. I saw the backlash and I saw that the, I was on Twitter all night looking at just reading things. Dion is an amazing, very heterosexual man who is comfortable in his skin and the way the internet just went at him for that one red carpet look. But this man, is, he's known for dripping in Gucci. 
and just, you know, pushing the envelope when it comes to color. But I'm no expert when it comes to the fashion industry. What I will say is that I'm a, I am privy to what the history is and where we are and what my own personal style is. And, you know, I always advocate for the fact that men should be allowed to dress how they choose to. And that is simply, that's how history is repeating itself because people are realizing I couldn't wear that then and feel safe. I can now. I know I do. I have at least four pair of platform um, boots now because then I couldn't wear it. My dad wasn't going for it. And my uncle sure as hell wasn't gonna let me. But in now in this, I'm when I'm in New York City, it's 2020. I wanna play around in this. And then if I'm being completely honest, I feel most alive and most successful and, and eager to learn more and, and, and interact with people when I play in my fashion, when I'm able to kind of mix a masculine piece with a feminine piece. Men want to feel sexy. And if I'm being completely honest, we don't feel sexy in suits all the time. You know, the same thing for women. They, all, they don't always feel sexy in a dress. So, but that's a whole nother conversation because then you talk about the, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Well, the separation when it comes to what women can do and what men can't, you know, but. Double standard? Yes, the double standard, yes. So. Awesome. You bring out so many points and I'm like thinking to myself, okay, I gotta <laughs> talk about this. Okay, yeah. gotta talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> you will definitely be back. <laughs> So let's discuss New York Fashion Week and yes. how that's being navigated right now in the mix of COVID-19. So it's a very just you can you can feel the sadness in New York City. I got back yesterday and I had to go into the city today um, for a few meetings. You genuinely can feel the gap because it's essentially non-existent. You have a few um, designers. Uh, going on right about now it should be and yeah. we do have three days the day before yesterday yesterday and today three days where there were actual shows i believe it was tommy hilfiger gucci prada um the cfda show that did i'm gonna say oh i can't remember oh darn but it wasn't i want to say maybe exactly 10 shows between the last three days that were actually live Everyone else has already shown through since the since COVID has started because we weren't sure what September was going to look like. So you had everyone like Balmain, Louis Vuitton, Chanel, these bigger houses have already shown um, digitally. And so that's kind of been the space. Those that are actually showing in, in physical locations now just wanted to push the envelope. And I think I'm not gonna say that it was a bad move, but it may have just been too big of a push during COVID um, because the people that needed to see it, I don't think saw it. That, so the people- How is that gonna impact in the fall and spring? Because right now this is what you see for the coming season. Mm -hmm. So how would that impact? Because really some people are going to the mall but they're not but with mm -hmm. skills um just an in influencing for what's to what's to come so uh, one of my favorite stylists is jay boylan love mm -hmm. him so i follow him you know through instagram so are we going to start seeing more shows through social media or lives on youtube or in instagram or just a look book through pinterest or instagram or how how, how are we want to know like hey, this is what's trending, this is what's coming up, scrap this color, this is hot. Like, how are we supposed to stay on top of that? I think it's going to be, it's going to be a mix of all of those things. But I think when it comes to New York Fashion Week and how fashion is presented to you, we're going to see a very nostalgic feel about this, meaning it isn't going to be this thing where you know what's happening. The who's who will be, will be in the loop and it may just be something that comes across your newsfeed or your email box um, or physical mail, what have you. I don't think for a while we're gonna see the return to the streets. And I don't think you're gonna, I don't expect to see a lot of actual shows. You're gonna see presentations, music videos. There's gonna be a lot of influence from artists actually physically wearing these pieces and identifying it that way. You're gonna see a lot more newspaper magazines 
happening. If you pick up a magazine now, believe it or not, you're looking at a lot of fluff work because Instagram has already given it to you. What you need from a magazine, Instagram has already given to you. You've gotten your gossip. You've gotten your dose of who's who, what to wear. Um, you know, everything from what you should do for your skin. Social media has given that, but I think you will see a return to publication digitally more so where you get to go in and fully kind of scope the coming season. Um, and this is where Vogue picks up its momentum again. Vogue is essentially the capital for all publication when it comes to everything fashion. Or Vanity so, Fair. Or Vanity Fair. And I would love to see Essence and Ebony return because Essence did a fantastic job in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Definitely. They were on it with the fashion and covering it and letting you know what was coming. Um, yeah. And I think that's because you had a younger demographic controlling what their media looked like for them, um, but they slowly died off when social media became a, became a thing. Um, COVID also has just pushed publications to focus on their media outlets. So now they're understanding, you know, as much as I love receiving my Vogue subscription, um, I still open the Vogue app. And so the pieces like Ebony, Essence, um, I forget, Hype Hair, all of these individuals and Triple X, those of them who don't necessarily focus on their media outlets, in the coming months, I think all of 2021, you're going to see publications push out their media coverage and you're gonna see the return of bloggers. You're gonna see their return to bloggers being your inside um, scoop, so to speak. Um, and I, I honestly love that. That's where I started MySpace uh, in 2003 to 2007. MySpace was my place to go ahead and dish on everything that was happening from music, fashion, boys, and everything else. So I'm excited about it. I could be completely wrong and we may return, no, but I, I feel I like- I agree with you because I think we see that now with Instagram for getting the Reels feature, mm -hmm. you have IGTV, and then you have mm -hmm. TikTok where you get snippets yep. of things as well. So I think mm -hmm. in the combination um, with the Instagram and the TikTok, and then YouTube has become an, its own uh, entity yes. in itself. Uh, mm -hmm. I think those three components, that's the places to go. Uh, when I was watching the documentary and they were featuring Misa and um, she was discussing the corset, corset that she made, the MCM mm -hmm. corset, not knowing the person she was making it for. And then you look up and you see um, eight, you know, with uh, mm -hmm. Beyonce and Jay-Z and it's like, oh, yes you know yeah so i mean i'm hoping this is the avenue that everything returns to uh which is why i've been like working on relaunching my youtube uh but that in my writing um i also write for access report which is a digital magazine uh founded by naomi who is a black woman who is completely everything fashion um and you know, with the interviews that I've done and the covers that I've done on just fashion designers and what the world is during COVID and what is going to be post COVID, I am learning, you know, a lot of what this generation has never experienced and what you and I have and what we took advantage of back in the day um, is where we're returning to because there was so much more exclusivity to that. You know, it wasn't kind of just like, if you want to buy a ticket, then you can go. No, you had to be invited. You had to have some form of credentials. You've had to work to earn, you know, where, you know, this is why you and I in our um, individual spaces, we've worked so hard because it's all we know. We know that we need to work to be a part of these things. Yeah, where and today, a thing for us. Right, you know? So, you know, this generation where everything is at the click of a thumb, they're gonna have to, oh, I gotta put in work. Oh, I need to do research. Oh, I need to do case, like to say case study, in regards to fashion, I've had interns like, what? I'm sorry, you don't experiment and find out what works, what doesn't, what's the understanding? Like, I'm big, my baby brother is too. We're big on case study, we're big on the research, having to figure out the why behind the reasoning. You know, I love the saying, um, the rhyme of reason, and people, when people say that, they don't get it. The rhyme is the research. The reason is the aftermath. The research, like, it's just, it's, it's, it's a big thing for me. So I'm excited to hopefully see that because then you get that quality blogger who knows what she's talking about, who shows up 
and can outshine any editor in an executive position. You know, I miss those days. We'll just have to write it out and wait and see, huh? <laughs> okay, listen, the way 2020 is going, we're gonna be in 2021 in no time. Okay, this year has flown by, thank God. <laughs> I know. Well, first of all, you're just dropping so many nuggets and jewels. So I wanna say thank you. So what is to come for Noah Love? What's on your radar? Oh dear God, do we have the time for this? No. Um, so uh with IA models, um during COVID, I've landed exactly 12 campaigns for my clients, and we have another two before the end of September. Um, I am working on revamping my roster. Um, and so I will be reintroducing and introducing a total of 17 models come October. Um, being at Productions, we have our return to our model workshop. It is uh, happening October 25th. All the information will be on our website the moment we are given the green light to announce it because with COVID, we can't technically say location and time because of the whole body count, so to speak. Um, I also represent two launching brands. They're both cosmetics and that's directly under IA and VNF Productions. Um, I am the creative director for LC Paris Cosmetics. And so we have our new line of lashes coming out um, later this year. I also represent a lash brand that will be launching uh, the first week of the new year. Um, I will push out my next five pieces for access report um, in the coming days. And I also manage influencers for access PR. So you can essentially follow all of this. Book um, this Book. <laughs> I am working very hard to say that. Um, and then season four of my podcast launch in October. So that is a big deal because you know better than anyone and some of you listening and watching producing and I say not creating producing a podcast is no light task okay there is a lot of work that goes into the thought of it the production of it the post production and then pushing that bad boy out so to have fire <laughs> listen okay so essentially producing Noah online the podcast has been um, that's kind of like my pride and joy right now, because that's my outlet to do similar to what you're doing. I get to just journey through my process and share these nuggets in hopes that it creates a domino effect where younger generations know that they can do this and they should do it all. Um, I'm very, very, very excited about that. Again, I'm very excited about, uh, relaunching my YouTube. I am Noah Love, um, and that journeys through fashion and editorial. Um, that's where I get to kind of be the true fashion lover there. Um, but this is honestly all of that. This is just me kind of working through the grace of God where I'm just going where he leads. And it sounds like a lot, but I promise you, I feel bored most days. Like, I feel like I'm not doing enough. Um, oh, and book, hopefully 2021. It has been in the works for a while. I've been writing. Another reason to perform. Yes, that. another reason for me to come back to speak to you, to see your beautiful face. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be a, I make sure it's gonna be a productive year. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, we gotta do the plug. People need to find yes. you. And we want yes. to find you. So <laughs> let them know where they can find you. Okay, so to make this all very easy, you guys can find me literally anywhere at I am Noah Love. Um, that's my Twitter. Don't follow me. No, I'm kidding. It's that's where I vocalize all of my realness. Um, Instagram, Facebook, all of it. I am Noah Love. And then everything that I'm a part of is tagged in my bio. Um, Access, uh, VNF Productions, I Models. Um, I'm a brand ambassador for a cosmetics company. It's all there. Um, just I am Noah Love. Find me, come say hi. I converse with everybody. I love meeting people. I love talking, giving free advice, whatever I can, whatever I can. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> thank so, you so much for having me, beautiful. Thank you for joining me. So um, it's amazing when you're just in the moment, how relationships can blossom and yes. turn into something amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This has been, this has been fun. I 
I'm not good about talking about myself, so I hope I didn't embarrass you on your podcast. Oh, you're um, oh, you know. I learned a lot listening to you. I'm just like, wow, he is just so. Oh, much- yay. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love when people learn talking to me because sometimes I feel like yes. I just ramble. Yes, I love it. Well, guys, this has been another episode of the Speaker Podcast. I hope you got something from it. I'm your host, Camille Essick. And until next time, be blessed. Bye bye.